place we gather today. So uh, really excited about this session. Um, our session is focused on the role of tourism in connecting a new generation of, uh, to nature. And it might not just be new meaning young, um, but those generations past too that uh, aren't connected. So we're interested in full connection at this session. Um, and we're gonna have case studies uh, organized around partnerships and lessons learned from the tourism sector to inspire these generations towards greater appreciation of advocacy, stewardship, and parks and other protected areas. I have a, a wonderful panel of speakers and we're gonna do this session a little bit, perhaps a little bit different than other sessions you might have been to. Uh, each speaker has been challenged with presenting only 6.5 minutes of their material. And at the end of those presentations, what we'd like to do is really uh, brainstorm with you all. Um, so we'll have different uh, groups up here and we'll really brainstorm and identify success stories and factors that have worked. Uh, we'll compile these and that'll be another thing and another reason to put your name and email on that piece of paper and we'll send that out to you. Um, my group of speakers today is Dr. Anna Spensley from South Africa, Matt McKellen, McClellan and Tara Wells from Australia, Angus Robinson from Australia, Wenyang Mu from China, Rhonda Green from Australia, Dr. Rhonda Green, Dr. Jim Barbarak from the USA, and myself uh, from the USA. So to get us started, Anna Spensley, will you please join me? Um, thank you, Kelly. Um, morning, everybody. Um, I want to speak to you a little bit about um, the Tourism and Protected Areas Specialist Group, um, which is one of the specialist groups within the World Commission on Protected Areas, um, and how we're trying to work to engage and inspire you. Um, but just before I do, I just want to reflect on a personal experience I've had. Before the Congress, I was in Cairns for a two-week holiday, which was fabulous. Um, beautiful rainforest, amazing reef, and with our little toddler, who's two and a half years old. And I have to say, she's just enjoyed being in nature, in the park, seeing the fish, seeing the trees and the birds. So actually just getting our children to these protected areas can really inspire them from a young age. But in terms of the Tapas group, um, we have a structure which is really multi-generational um, in terms of our membership and our exco. We have some veterans who've been working in protected areas and tourism for many, many years, and some young, really inspiring people that are coming through. Um, within our structure, including um, Elena Nikolava and Sue Snyman, who are both really em good emerging experts in the field. In terms of our membership, we have about 266 members um, globally, and a quarter of our membership are youth or engaged with youth regularly um, through academia and the students. And we really want to try and encourage more people to join and engage with um, the um, people within our group. And our traditional approach has generally been to develop um, literature and tools to build capacity and to network, which are fairly standard approaches for specialist group. But what we're trying to do more of, and then really in trying to outreach to people that um, are young and are using different forms of communication, is to use more online media and more um, webinars um, so that more people who are more globally distributed um, can, you can access the information and can network with our members. So this is a range of the different social media that we distributed on. We have an excellent um, communications expo manager, Ron Maida, he's based in Mexico. And he's been really hard at work putting this on Facebook, on LinkedIn. We also have a Twitter um, hashtag for this Congress, if you want to use it, which is hashtag WCP Tourism. Um, and even I've been using Twitter and I'm real nervous about this and I've been getting little lessons from people amongst the Congress. So I'd really encourage you and others to try and really outreach to the new generation using these different communication channels. And I hope I didn't go over Kate. Thank no, you. you're super, you just gave everybody three more seconds. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. 
Our next speakers are Matt McClellan and Tara Wells from Australia, and they're going to speak about equipping people for a lifelong love of nature. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, for that, I'd like to also acknowledge the uh, traditional owners and custodians of this land, both past and present, uh, and thank them for their kind welcome uh, to us. Um, it was Jacques Cousteau who said people protect uh, what they love, and we've spoken a little bit about love over the last few days, but I wanted to drill in on that idea a little bit more, because as a kid, I learned what love is through TV. It's that idea that you get when you see your princess for the first time, when that door opens and your knees wobble and your spine tingles and you have that overwhelming sense of joy and you just know it's going to be happily ever after, yeah? Um, the ancient Greek, though, had five words for love and at the bottom is that Walt Disney definition. But at the top of their ideas of love was this beautiful word called agape. And agape is this sense of love that's not based on how I feel, uh, but based on how I care for her. It's the sacrifice that I make for her well-being. It's the dad who jumps in front of the bus to save his kid. It's um, the husband who, I, I don't know, gives up the football to do the dishes. It, it's crazy, isn't it? But, but isn't that the kind of love that we need to instill in the next generation and, and maybe in our own generation? It's, it's that kind of love I think we need to see uh, Jacques' uh, vision idea come true. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I love these beautiful images we have around of nature, uh, but I do worry that we use them in some times to send a message that, you know, I think we're pornifying nature. I think we say sometimes that she's only a value when she's beautiful, that sometimes we send this expectation that she just can't meet and shouldn't be expected to meet. Um, and, and Tara is soon going to talk about how do we build this sense of agape, this sense of sacrificial love in a community uh, whilst they're out in nature. Uh, but, but to give away a little bit of her talk, I think it comes down to the first date. Uh, if we can get the first date right, uh, then I think it sets people on the right course. And by first date, I mean the first hike or the first canoe trip or whatever it is that we do to engage people out there for the first time. You see. If people are stressed on their first date, they're worried about themselves. They're worried about their own survival. But if we can equip people so that whilst they're out there, they know what they're going to eat, how they're going to sleep, what they're going to drink, and all those things, they have capacity to care for her. They have capacity to not worry about their own survival, but, but maybe that leave no trace stuff makes sense and they have space to do those sort of things. They have capacity to care. And if we get that first date right, then maybe the second date uh, goes well as well. And there'll be room for a third date and hopefully a lifelong love affair uh, set in the right direction. Thanks, Matt. So I'll be sharing how three, sorry, how three seemingly opposing groups have applied the same principle of inspiring agape love but differently. So to inspire, we set about creating Sydney as a walking destination, to reimagine Australia's largest city as a place rich in natural assets. Walking volunteers made it possible to walk from one end of Sydney to the other, working with local and state government to connect nearly 300 kilometres of walking trails, linking urban and natural areas. The Wild Walks website targets self-guided walkers, providing detailed track notes to inspire short breaks in nature. And Sydney Coast Walks educates using established tourism channels. So that's trade events, free of charge industry tours, glossy travel agent brochures, PR, local and international media coverage, and social media like Facebook. So efforts designed to inspire are the first step of the travel decision cycle. It's where people add walking to their wish list versus bar hopping and bus tours. 
So make it possible, make it desirable, and now you've got them here, what next? Put simply, entertain them. You see, every place has a story, and it's these stories we tell that allow people to truly understand and appreciate the land they're walking through. While surface beauty that Matt mentioned can be enough to fall in love, we all know the secret to a long-lasting relationship is a deeper, more complex understanding. So that may be tours with commentary, guidebooks, interpretive signage. Do what you can to create connection. The final way to foster the highest ideal of agape love is to first take care of the basics, to equip the next generation with the tools they need. So answer questions like how to get there, not just by car, but by public transport too. Offer hotel transfers or for better eco-credentials, design the tour around public transport where possible. Good preparation makes the experience. So talk fitness levels, describe the track, spell out what shoes to wear and the way to their heart, through their stomach of course, the latest tourism research shows that the food experience is really important. So promote nearby cafes or surprise them with a picnic out on the track. Let's just say it works, that by inspiring, entertaining and equipping the next generation, they've fallen head over heels. They want to shout it from the rooftops. First comes love, then comes TripAdvisor. You might think of TripAdvisor in terms of hotel reviews or reviews of tours, but search for, say, things to do in Sydney, and the results default to what TripAdvisor calls attractions, not tours. Some of the top reviews are of walking trails and outdoor spaces. So land managers, you need to be five star too. In this day of peer review on steroids, TripAdvisor can make or break visitation to natural areas in the same way that it can make or break a tourism business. So please, go ahead and borrow the tools of tourism users because whether you're a community group, an information resource, land manager or even something else, we should all aim to inspire Agape. Thanks. Thank you very much and very concise tips for, for the next generation and for our land managers, which is a really important point. Uh, next on our list of uh, wonderfully inspiring people, we have Angus Robinson, and he's going to talk about geotourism inspiring the next generation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Kelly. Today, I'm going to talk about a new global phenomenon, geotourism, which will capitalise on rapidly evolving digital platforms such as smartphones and social media to inspire a new generation which lives and breathes on this technology platform. Geotourism, connecting people to parks, the environment and planet underpinned by geology and landscapes. So geotourism is sustainable tourism which focuses on an area, geology and landscape as a basis for providing visual, uh, visitor engagement, learning and enjoyment. Geotourism does inspire young people. When we look at the what we mean by the environment, it's as simple as A, B and C. Abiotic, geology, landscapes, the climate, B, for bio biodiversity, flora and fauna, and C, for culture. Geotourism enables people to better understand natural heritage and to enjoy cultural experiences that explains how people's past and present have lived in that environment. And geotourism sits along with ecotourism, cultural tourism, heritage, indigenous, agritourism, sightseeing and cuisine, as either geotourism as the whole of the place or geotourism focusing on geology and landscape. It involves a whole range of stakeholders, 
principal of what those, of course, you'd expect to be geologists. And geologists now, retired geologists, are now using their abilities and communication skills to talk to young and old people alike. Geotourism also occurs across a wide diversity of sites, and I'd like to speak very brief, briefly about three of those. Caves, karst areas, national parks, and Australia's national landscapes. Janolan Caves in the Blue Mountains World Heritage Area was once Australia's principal tourist attraction. It is the epitome of what geotourism is all about. In national parks, the Grand Canyon in the USA is arguably the world's most exemplar focused example of geotourism, the trail of time, a virtual exhibition of geology. And in Australia, we have 16 national landscapes, all exemplifying geotourism at its best. Here in Sydney, we're in the Sydney Harbour National Landscape. And then, of course, we've got the Red Centre, a continental landscape. And then I'll speak briefly about what's happening in the hinterland, Australia's coastal wilderness. The Red Centre, combining geology, red kangaroos, and, of course, Indigenous culture. In these shots from the Red Centre, the Uluru means a lot as its landforms are interpreted by the Indigenous people in a way that is as important as their geological interpretation. And of course the flora and fauna, as exemplified in this national landscape, is there because of the geology. In Australia's coastal wilderness, south of Sydney, we have 16, 16 uh, sites or geosites which are connected through what we call a geojourney. And what we've been able to do in uh, working this through with the um, Geological Survey of Sweden is to build a platform. We're collaborating internationally on a project called Geotreat. And Geotreat is a smartphone application which people from all around the world can use to best understand and appreciate the importance of geotourism. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Angus. That was very inspiring. And as we continue our journey of being inspired, we have Ms. Wenyang Mu from China, and she's going to talk about family ecotourism in China. Everyone, I'm Wen Yang from Wildlife Institute at Beijing Forestry University, China. It's a great honor to be here and sharing with you a study case of inspiring parents and children towards greater appreciation for the protected area in China. China is experiencing rapid economic growth, uh, while it is also bringing unpredicted environment impact. Recently, People have to start concerning environment protection, and many parents want their children having experience in the wild. But compared with North America, Canada, uh, China is still lack of camping or picnic experience for children. As a result, most children don't have enough experience in nature, and school can't take on this responsibility because of the safety issue. As a solution, we try to organize this family ecotourism, that, uh, eco tour that combines ecotourism and field work by engaging parents and children in volunteering work and the scientific research. We offer them an experience together in protected area to evolve a real nature conservation. We choose Li Ziping Nature Reserve in Yaan, Sichuan Province. It is famous for giant pandas. Uh, here, captive bred pandas are released and attracted through GPS uh, coloring. There are three main parts in our tour. First, volunteer work, uh, and then sec uh, scientific research and the local ethnic community, the E-nationality. Uh, for the volunteering work, 
Uh, families went to Bifengxia Giant Panda Center, which is one of the main areas for captive pandas inhabiting in. Parents supported children doing some volunteer work like uh, cleaning cages and feeding pandas. Then children learned doing some basic behavior survey on pandas. And the team enjoyed conservation life in Li Ping Nature Reserve. Here, children and parents assist scientists working on basic research for pandas. The scientists taught children basic knowledge about giant pandas and led them hiking along the patrolling footpath, showing them how to set the camera traps. The leader and their parents had to encourage the children to accomplish their task, as many of them never had similar experience in nature. They, uh, they also experienced a lot with local ethnic community. Children from city exchange gifts with local children and spend a whole day in the village. They play with local children and help the whole family preparing for dinner. And uh, that's the overview. And after the eco tour, participants were asked to finish a questionnaire. And you show that uh, everyone is satisfied with the tour. And the favorite uh, part of the project is uh, feeding pandas, and the most disliked one is uh, hiking, patrolling. And uh, there were key points we learned from the family tours. Uh, parents and children have different interests for nature. Uh, next time, we may take them to one place to make sure that parents know their children are safe, and then arrange activities of parents and the children in the way of sep separately and together. Uh, in this way, parents can not only help their children build environment consciousness, but also have fun themselves. And uh, we also contribute to enhancing local culture, benefit holds the community and their heritage. Uh, if you are interested in our project, we left some uh, postcard and things uh, on this table. And to conclude my presentation, oh, to conclude my presentation, we should uh, promote family ecotourism in China. Children will become responsible travelers who enjoy the nature and participate in nature conservation. They can be ambassadors to the new generation themselves. We hope by tapping into our professional knowledge, we can help more and more children and teenagers learn in nature, appreciate nature, and act positively to protect the nature. Thank you. Excellent, and it reminds us to um, actually look and measure how we're doing these connections and whether or not they're working. And I think that really is an excellent example of how to follow up with that kind of research. Which leads me to our next presentation, but I'm going to take time for a commercial break. There are two pieces of paper circulating around through the audience, and we'd like to be able to share these presentations with you and share the outcomes of our roundtable discussion. So if you see those pieces of paper floating around, please put your name and email if you'd like further information uh, from this session today. Next, we have Dr. Rhonda Green, and she's gonna talk a little bit more about research and looking at ways to inspire by involvement in volunteer wildlife research. So Rhonda, please join us. Peter Wood, Dr. Peter Wood was not able to be with me today, but he uh, was very instrumental in starting off the research network that we're talking about. So, from lions in the zoo to butterflies in the garden to organize nature games, there's a lot of opportunities for children to experience nature and switch, uh, switch on to nature, get their interest ignited. Although there are some problems now too, with public liability problems, a lot of holiday farms won't let them gather eggs or milk cows, and there's a lot of um, restrictions now. Schools, even tertiary institutions, are less inclined to take take their students on um, outdoor outings, which is a great pity. But once we do get the children switched on, once we ignite that flame. How do we keep that flame alive once they become teenagers? Suddenly, it's not so cool to go bird watching or even visit a zoo. 
um, teenagers are into um, much more intense schoolwork, study for your career, and um, yeah, often out of touch with other people that might share the enthusiasm that they have been ignited with. Well, the research network that I'm about to talk about is one way that we can, um, can help to switch them on. The research network was start oh, sorry. Yeah, the research network was originally started to get tour operators in touch with each other. Uh, tour operators who, didn't, who were each doing their own little bit of research, didn't know the others existed. We've broadened that to getting them in touch with academic researchers for collaboration and exchange of ideas to mutual benefit and also now to reaching out to volunteer researchers. And this can include people of all ages. It includes young adults traveling, includes teenagers traveling alone, and includes families traveling with children. Uh, it can bring people together, people that have felt a bit isolated, a little bit discouraged, both from thinking, you know, there's no one else that shares my enthusiasm. Well, now they're meeting people that do, they're meeting the researchers, and these are people they can actually talk to and identify. They're not just people up there somewhere, some kind of different species, but people like them who had this enthusiasm when they were younger and now working in the fields, they can also get ideas for how they can use some of the, um, the knowledge that they're gaining through joining in with this research, uh, not only becoming wildlife biologists themselves, but if they're working as engineers or Town, plan town planners or in other careers later to bring in their understanding of the wildlife component. Um, and yeah, one thing that discourages young people when they hear all this doom and gloom and think, oh gee, there's nothing I can do about it, uh, all this stuff that I've learned to love is going to be gone by the time I'm an adult anyway, um, and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, joining in as a volunteer research assistant can give that little bit of confidence that yes, hey, maybe there is something I can do about it and there's these people doing something about it and I can join them. And, um, yeah, um, sorry, gone the wrong way. Yeah, so I mentioned doom and gloom before. A lot of young people are sort of switching off. They're, they're, they're not listening to uh, nature documentaries. They're not listening to messages about the environment because it's just, too depressing. I think we've got to get the captivation first, get this love of nature. Then, um, then there's room for the real concern that's born from that love of nature and hey, what's happening to it and can I do something about it? We also need to get the right concept. I've sort of got three, five C's here. Um, get the concepts through of the, the um, accurate messages, the ecological underpinning of some of these conservation problems. And joining in some of these wildlife research programs, yeah, is one way of getting those concepts through. Oh, one thing I, I forgot to mention, also getting young people out there helping with research can sometimes be their first experience of being alone in the wilderness in a safe way and just seeing the world as it was before the colonizers arrived, maybe before any humans arrived. To, uh, to this part of the world. I, I remember that had a really deep impact on me the first time I went walking through uh, Lamington National Park out to the heathlands amongst the rain, surrounded by the rainforest looking out over this. Hey, this is how the Aboriginals saw it before, before our race arrived. This is maybe how it was before even the Aboriginals ever saw it and it had a really powerful effect on me. Um, but also, yeah. Um, also socialising, so there's this solitude in nature, there's the socialising with others. Okay, from, from this comes the cooperation with other people and seeing what we can do and outcome of that, more stewardship for our, nature, for our natural areas. Um, yeah, uh, if you'd like to look up what we're doing, uh, we've got a few of these flyers floating around. And if you can't remember the uh, URL here, uh, just Google Wildlife Research Network and you'll soon find that. 
And yeah, as I say, once we've once we've ignited that flame in young people, this is a, this is a way of just keeping that flame alive. Thank you. learning about all kinds of new and creative ideas for engaging the next generation and generations. Uh, we also have a, a great presentation coming up here by Dr. Jim Barbarak. Uh, he's going to talk about making p uh, protected areas relevant. So Jim, uh, welcome. Thank you all very much for coming out this morning. If we're going to inspire a new generation to love and cherish and care for parks, how do we do it? Particularly in countries and regions where the population is living primarily in urban areas. Though I am a U.S. Midwesterner, just like our, our uh, organizer here, my entire career has been spent working in Latin America, a region of over half a billion people, where in many of the countries, such as Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Venezuela, over 90% of the people live in cities, where individual urban agglomerations like Mexico City and Sao Paulo have nearly as many people as all of Australia or all of Canada. How do we get this new urban population to love parks, to care for parks, and visit them? Because it's often been said that a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a thousand pictures, but an experience is worth a thousand videos. So how do we get people out there? One of our biggest problems is that many people, particularly from outside of Latin America, still think that the average image of a Latin American is the individual at the top of this slide. Well, there are many indigenous people in Latin America, in some countries like Bolivia or Guatemala, they're the majority or near majority. But there are now more people to belong to the urban tribes, such as that demonstrated in the bottom picture, at the bottom right, than there are individuals living in rainforests. How do we reach that audience who spends seven hours a day looking at a screen, okay, who's turned off to nature, who's grown up in urban environments, who no longer are, are peasants living in the field like the folks in the middle of the picture? Visitation levels to protected areas throughout Latin America are incredibly low even for national parks located in the heart of large urban agglomerations. How are we going to change that? How are we going to get people interested in nature? And this is a task for protected area managers, for nonprofits, for the education system, and also for our for-profit tourism sector partners. So there are a number of things happening that are positive stories to relate to. The first is the growth in many countries of outing, outing clubs that have Facebook pages that weekly organize trips to protect areas, mostly near large cities, that announce these on Facebook and via Twitter. They're using social media to get the word out, trying to engage this new population. Another important thing is happening is that we're training many new individuals on how to build good trails, trails that are safe, that are enjoyable, uh, and that uh, are well designed so that they last a long time with low maintenance costs. A third thing is that governments and the donor community are understanding that visitation to natural areas is important for health, and it's also important for uh, increasing expenditure on recreation uh, and tourism, both by domestic audiences and by international audiences. And there's also a growth of special interest things like World Heritage Marathons and mountain biking races and treks. So there's a lot of positive things going on in the region. I'd like to just mention a, a few of them in particular. The first is the, uh, the Sendero de Chile. Uh, the Chilean government and a cooperating NGO with that same name, Sendero de Chile, are slowly building an 8,000 kilometer trail stretching from the Atacama Desert in the north of the country to Patagonia in the south, winding through the country's protected areas. And they are also organizing outings in both urban and rural protected areas on a regular basis and building trail infrastructure through investments by the Chilean government and cooperating organizations. In Brazil, uh, the country with the largest population in Latin America, there are both individual efforts to improve public use infrastructure and programs in national parks throughout the country, and also long distance trail efforts, such as Trails of Sao Paulo and the Carioca Trail in Rio de Janeiro State. Uh, the Inca Trail, 
which many of you have heard of Machu Picchu and seen people walking on the trail toward it. Uh, that five-day trek is just part of the possibility to spend basically years walking all the way from Argentina to Colombia. Uh, much of that is now a World Heritage Site and there are coordinated efforts at the way to recreate this uh, Inca route that, uh, and pre-Inca routes that have been there for hundreds of years already. Uh, aside from that, I would like to mention our own work uh, at Colorado State University, working with governments and NGOs and universities throughout Latin America to train cadres of basically trail wonks of people who really know how to design, build, maintain, and interpret trail infrastructure, which is a really critical need in many countries without a tradition of hiking and trekking. Uh, and uh, this has led to a number of spot-offs, such as a Trans-Panama Trail Initiative that's being designed across that country from east to west, uh, and uh, spin-off NGOs such as Walking Panama and Walking Chiapas. Chiapas is the southernmost most tropical state of Mexico where once again, weekly outings are being taken. These are being publicized using the web to engage a new generation of protected users, particularly among the urban youth. And I think something very important, the international development banks are now providing financing and countries are willing to go into debt and take out loans to improve trail infrastructure in places like the state of Sao Paulo or the countries of Costa Rica and Panama that are receiving multi-billion dollar loans from the Inter-American Development Bank, something like the World Bank for Latin America, uh, to improve infrastructure and to improve uh, uh, interpretation programs, particularly in their most visited parts. So there are a number of wonderful initiatives underway in the region. These are uh, inspiring youth. They're creating employment opportunities as guides in artisanry sales and associated enterprises for local people, indigenous and non-indigenous. And it's really great to see how these initiatives are blossoming throughout the region. So I'd like to thank three of my collaborators from Latin America who are leading some of these trails and outings groups in Latin America. It's wonderful to see how there's local leadership of these initiatives and I invite all of you that are not from Latin America to go visit a trail in that region soon. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. And that brings us to our final presentation uh, by yours truly. And I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna put a video on because I have several collaborators that unfortunately weren't able to attend the Congress, but I want them to speak. So they will be speaking. Um, but I'm gonna kick this off by saying uh, the, the presentation I'm about to make is really highlighting how ecotourism, an ecotourism operation in a rural community, rural highlands uh, region of Fiji created a partnership with conservation organization called Fiji, Nature Fiji, uh, Marangeti Fiji, and local schools and their parents to uh, really increase conservation efforts and create an educational outreach program in Fiji. So I'm gonna get this started. In 1998, Rivers Fiji started a whitewater rafting program in the rural highlands. This program set up a unique lease for conservation with nine Montsengali, or local landowners, in the upper Navua River, of which tourism contributes direct dollars to landowners and protects 18 kilometers of river corridor, which is a home to rare species and a fragile freshwater ecosystem. It's now Fiji's first Ramsar site. Revenue generated from Rivers Fiji whitewater rafting programs provide direct economic benefits uh, to local communities in the form of diverse employment and conservation-based lease payments and fees from tourism that support the protection of the Upper Navua Conservation Area. Regardless of the Ramsar designation, the benefits to communities and the lease for conservation, threats to the Upper Navua Conservation Area persist. These include illegal logging, gravel mining, and potential dam construction for hydroelectric power. Therefore, in an effort to protect and promote less extractive use of the River Canyon, environmental outreach programs were developed in partnership with Rivers Fiji, the Whitewater Rafting Program, Nature Fiji, Marangeti Fiji, and a locally based, uh, whose locally based mission is to generate enthusiasm and local expertise in all matters associated with wildlife conservation and management through raising the level of conservation and environmental awareness and education. The Upper Nuvua Conservation Area Environmental Outreach Program serves 
nine communities, several schools, and two villages. And uh, Nature Fiji played a significant role in the delivery of the educational component, while Rivers Fiji provided the logistics, um, the boats, <laughs> and the food to get people downriver. And here's some discussion from my friends. Is to uh, bring, you know, bring about, about a sense of pride in the children to know that their elders made a good decision to conserve this Upper Navajo Conservation Area and that they will inherit it in the future and that they will be the ones who will be managing it in the future. It sounds minute, but it carries a lot of weight when we think of it. Because when we visit this site, we must not leave anything behind to create damages to this uh, nice Christian environment. This is the first time I'm here. And uh, I, I really uh, want to say now is that uh, we should promote more of this in Fiji because uh, it is uh, creating uh, employment for the resource owners and at the same time uh, increasing uh, the capacity on why environment is important. And uh, so it is a source of uh, capacity building for policy makers and uh, officials uh, from government, non-governmental organizations and business committee that there is a way which we can utilize our environment in making income rather than damaging it. For future generations, uh, it's really good for us to protect this place here. Uh, because uh, firstly, uh, the part from the money that uh, the tourists usually give it to the rivers feed, part of the money goes to back to the people in the village. For us, uh, what we normally do for the money that the tourists they give it to the village, uh, we put it in the bank and when our kids, they did well in school to go to high school or uni, we use this money for them. Uh, it's really important to work together with Rivers Fiji because we protect this place here. We don't let mine companies or logging companies to come around here. They might destroy lots of things. following quotes are quotes from students that went on the uh, educational programs. What we did is gave each one of them cameras and asked them to take pictures of things they felt were important to them. And then we asked them to talk about the photos that they took while on the experience. I grew up in Fiji learning more about polar bears and tigers, you know, in storybooks. Um, and it was only when I was in university uh, that I finally found out that we had two endemic species of frogs and that we had these unique things in Fiji, plants and animals and places in Fiji that were found nowhere else in the world. Um, it was my environmental science course in university that took me into the interior of Fiji and to swim in the rivers and really enjoy Fiji's wildlife and wild places. And I remember the first time I came down this river, I just could not get over the canyons and how massive they were. And looking back on what I'd learned about how the canyons, the gorge was formed, such a such a beautiful place that I that I just uh, felt that the landowners they have to know about the beauty of this place and I wish that I could be one of the landowners' children so that I could say this is my home and uh, I'd like to protect it and it is for that reason that when we developed the uh, program we wanted to work with the children. This is theirs, this is their heritage, and it is only they who will protect it in all ways. So they have to be the ones who have to know its value, and know the stories behind it, and understand it, and know that they have the power to protect it or to lose it.
So thank you, Nunya. Thank you very much. Education is one strategy which helps promote the value of conservation and potentially ensure a level of awareness for future generations to come. We found not only individuals in the future generations, but their families and policymakers can, too, can also make this difference. So thank you very much. We're going to move into the next uh, portion of our program, which I'm really excited about, and I hope you are too. Come join us on a river trip, by the way. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do next with our time remaining, and, and you will also have a chance to uh, to talk with individuals at each of these tables. Um, but we're going to start with tables, and we may move to more tables, but generally up in this general direction. And we're going to talk about strategies for success um, and some of these topics underneath that. And myself and Daniel, Daniel, you want to stand up, and Phil, stand up. They'll be leading these discussions. Uh, we're also going to talk about various communication tools that can be developed. And Rhonda, who presented earlier, and Wenye, who also presented, and Tara are going to lead that discussion. So come up if you're interested in those. And then utilizing metrics and measurements to gauge success. How do we actually measure what we do? And Jim and Anna and Hannah are going to lead that discussion. And then engaging technology and strategies that speak to the next generation, which I'm sure all of us older folks might be interested <laughs> in learning that language. And Angus, who spoke to us earlier, and Joanne and Matt, are, or Joanne's not here today, but Matt and Angus are going to lead those discussions. So if you're interested, please come forward. We'll have folks stand up and sort of flag you down. These are the topics for the next uh, 15 minutes. And then we're going to come back together and share some ideas. So hopefully expand what we've learned already this morning. Thank you. Don't be shy. Yeah, I'm going to stop the video while we do the webinars.